Aye. All right, we're gonna start with uh, public comment. Actually, no, sorry, starting with adjustments to the agenda. Annie, can you take us through it? Absolutely. We have uh, our first adjustment to the agenda is uh, we will be hearing an update on the Mass Association of School Committee and Mass Association of Superintendent Conference from our chair, uh, Fasa Houdin. And we will also hear from two people who are attending the meeting this evening, uh, Sarah Ross from K-12 Undaunted. She led a session at the MASC-MASS conference. She'll be providing a summary and some highlights from that. And we also, I believe, uh, will have Jack Joukowsky from the Town Climate Committee joining us this evening and uh, to provide us some insight on um, some of the Town Climate Committee's work and how that may intersect with our 10-year capital plan. Um, to stay with one subject under capital plan, we will first continue a conversation on the 10-year capital plan and renewable en energy, and then we'll receive the update on cameras and environmental, environmental sensors. We're essentially just switching the order of the two items under C. We will not have business manager reports this evening. We will have those in January. We just received uh, updates a few weeks ago. And we added under updates, we will always have a standing agenda item of school committee member updates. And I believe those are all the adjustments. Great, thank you, Annie. Okay, we're moving next into public comment. As a reminder to the public, um, you have no more than three minutes to speak. We don't uh, respond or react right away. Um, the item that you're speaking about should pertain to something that's on the agenda. And um, if you are interested in making public comment, go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will unmute you. Okay, seeing none, uh, let's continue with the agenda. So um, presentation discussion items for the first item up is the fiscal year 24 budget, Annie and Chris. Yes, the presentation this evening will be brief. Just to remind people of the budget process, the first step is we send our preliminary projections to the town. The deadline to that, for that rather, was December 16th. We will adjust the budget as needed prior to having our public hearing on the budget in March. Those adjustments will do in collaboration with the town finance subcommittee, FinCom, and with the town select board. Our preliminary budget, I would argue, uh, is in really good shape. We're looking at this point in time uh, at a total increase to total expenses of 1.66 and an increase to our request for local funds or the town portion, an increase of 2% from fiscal year 23 or an increase of approximately $157,000. One thing that we've included in our preliminary presentation is a table showing increases in local contribution over the last few fiscal years. And what we've seen since fiscal year 21 was a 1.7% increase in fiscal year 21 a 0% increase in fiscal year 22, this is all in local contribution, a 3% increase in fiscal year 23, and we're requesting a 2% increase in fiscal year 24. The school department also returned $387,000 roughly to the town in fiscal year 21, and in fiscal year 22, approximately $55,000 was returned from the school department to the town. The budget that we're presenting would allow us to fund services and programs that align with the strategic priorities that we've laid out in our district strategy document that goes through 2024. I'll just point out some of the highlights. We are looking to expand our STEAM program, that's Science, Tech, Engineering, Arts and Mathematics at Hadley Elementary School by increasing the teacher from a 0.6 FTE 
three days a week to five days a week, a 1.0 FTE. This budget includes providing individualized support in the least restrictive environment per individual education plans, and in, which involves increasing our educational support professionals by three positions. This budget allows us to meet increased behavior and behavioral and social and emotional health needs of all students at, by adding 1.0 FTE in behavioral health staff. Um, we, are, we have added and we talked about this and it will be funded through grants in fiscal year 23 and in fiscal year 24, the safe and supportive, the safe schools rather, and diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist. The budget includes professional development to support tiered systems of support, including professional development and responsive classroom training, technical assistance from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst for implementation of positive behavior frameworks, clinical supervision for our behavioral health staff from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, as well as professional development and technical support in the implementation of restorative justice. We're also updating our curriculum, our FLY5, which is our evidence-based social and emotional learning curriculum, and we are purchasing new science and math textbooks for Hopkins Academy. Our science and math textbooks at the high school are very outdated. And we have some increased facilities expenses, primarily reflecting increased costs to energy. Again, I want to underscore that at this point in time, fully funding priorities that we have previously identified in our strategic plan and expanding and enhancing existing programs, we're able to present a request to the town of an increase of 2% over last fiscal year and a total increase to the operating budget of 1.66. Thank you, Annie. Um, I found the budget documents helpful to read, especially the year over year uh, it increases. So thank you for putting this together. Um, I have two questions. The first is you've submitted it to town before their deadline. Have you heard anything back from the town about what you shared? That's the first question. Have you gotten any feedback? And number two, what are the key next steps to uh, keep the ball moving? When when does the, uh, remind us of that timeline and when that public presentation happens um, and sure. so forth. Sure. So I have not heard directly from the town, although every department had to submit their budgets just by last Friday. And I don't think the select board has met since that time. And I'm sure that Joyce, when she gives updates, at her time in the meeting can provide some more information on that. Typically what happens after this, I'll be brief on what's happened previously. And again, Joyce can add anything when she speaks. Typically the treasurer and the town administrator would review all of the requests. I believe then they'll go to the finance subcommittee. The department heads are asked then to meet with the finance subcommittee and the finance subcommittee uh, I believe presents some of these requests to the select board between now and when we have public hearing in March. So the town votes on the budget the first Thursday in May, that annual town meeting. And prior to that May meeting, we must have a public hearing that we advertise in the newspaper on the budget. We can have that as late as April. Typically we schedule that in March. Should something happen, then we're able to have that public meeting in April. We can't, the town can't vote on a school department budget until the school committee's had a public hearing and vote on the budget. Between now and March, I will be communicating and Chris will be communicating with the town administrator, with the select board, should they request any information, finance subcommittee. And of course, even the select board is waiting for final numbers. I don't even believe we have a preliminary, what's called a cherry sheet right now in terms of state estimates. Um, so some of these things could change. Uh, and I'm not sure at this point in, town, in time that the town even has an indication of what state aid will look like and those revenues will look like. But that's, we're in conversation. We'll bring back updates and adjustments every month to the school committee in preparation for the public hearing in March. Very good, thank you. Um, Ethan, Tara, Christine, Paul, any uh, questions for Annie on the budget? I have a handful of questions, Annie. Um, 
Thank you. Yeah, I do think it's well presented. So um, probably a shout out to Chris and, and you. Thank you. Um, the oil and electricity costs obviously going up. We're comfortable that that's the appropriate level of increase or is that more of a, a, a guess? I think it's always a guess. However, I'll also invite Chris to, after I just instilled that vote of confidence to the public, feel free to follow up on that. No, I, was, I, I should have said in. it, but it is. Oh, it's a crystal ball. We did increase in. last year by 25%, and yeah. now we're increasing again. We have another increase on top of last year's increase. But I know Chris has been in ongoing communication with our energy, the person who manages our energy contracts. So he might be able to speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, I can. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I guess um, whether or not it's a good estimate depends on what day we're looking at it, because the price has has gone up big time. Um, it's now come back down. We just filled up our tanks last week, I believe it was, at 301 a gallon. Um, <clears throat> and the 301 was not a locked in price because the vendor just would not lock in prices this year. Um, you know, I guess just really with the volatility of the market, they would not do that. Um, so what we have, and if I could just um, pull up the budget quickly to just double check what the rate is that we're using, I just have to find the fuel line here. Oh, say, so, okay, so we're using, we're using a, a rate of roughly Three dollars and fifty cents uh, per gallon, um, and that's. Uh, I mean, not, I'm sorry, not not three dollars and fifty cents. Um, Two dollars and fifty cents. Sorry, um, and and that's uh, you know kind of an estimate of um, where the where we'll end up. I did speak with our energy consultant at the collaborative. And, uh, you know, he said to keep an eye on it. Again, he's hesitant to, um, to offer a prediction, which I don't blame him. Um, but he said that keep an eye for it to go down. Uh, watch for it right at the beginning of next uh, calendar year, which is Jan uh, you know, January of 23. Uh, that's when we're able to lock in our price. And if it hits the, uh, the target that we have, jump on it at that point. So Okay. That is exactly what we will do. And it it looks to be an approximation of what we expect the price to be. Yeah, because, you know, 301 at a not locked in price, we can expect it to be about 40 cents a gallon cheaper. So that puts us right in the ballpark. You know, we're at 256 for a price in the budget. It's about 261 for a lock in price. Okay. So it's close. Over the last few years, though, prior to recent times, it was closer in the ones, right? Typically, less. yes. Yeah. In FY twenty two, one roughly one sixty five, right? That's just you're building the twenty five percent over each year. That's correct. Yes. Okay. If you could figure that out, Chris, that'd be helpful. That whole oil. Sure. Thing. Yeah. Then uh, finally, two well, two more questions. One is and also for you, Chris. There's eleven and a half thousand increase for maintenance on the ground. I'm just curious. Is that is that uh, associated with the new fields? It's uh, it's actually not associated with the new fields because we added that to the budget last year. Yeah. Um, what it is is um, adding the elementary school to have a vendor mow those uh, grounds as well. Um, with the difficulties of finding custodians, and, and trust me, it, it really has been incredibly difficult. Um, we basically um, cons uh, not consulted, but farmed out the. Um, the maintenance of the grounds to a vendor that frees up the custodian who used to do it to work on cleaning the interior of the building. So okay. um, it, it, it's really just a, uh, something that will allow the building to stay clean with, uh, you know, the fewer staff that we're dealing with right now. Okay. I hadn't realized that was an issue. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Um, so one last question, maybe for you, Annie, the, programs with other school districts, so the vocational, the payments to mass schools, the payments to non-public schools, a lot of those have gone down. Um, but is it is that just normal fluctuation of classes and or do you do you take anything from that? Is there anything you, you deduce from that? So part as we do uh, 
additional presentations on the budget, I'll provide you with charts so you can see some of these trends over time. You'll be you'll see those charts in January and in February. With vocational schools, we've seen a downward trend. So what you're seeing there is going from 19 to 15. And we always keep placeholders in the budget for freshmen. So we're delivering a budget right now in December, an estimate, but students really start making some of these choices in the spring. We have see, seen a decrease in students going out to vocational schools. I would like to think that some of the programming that we're offering now at the high school may be part of that. It's certainly not all of it. It's not, we don't have chapter 74 programs at the high school, but there could be a connection there. In terms of special education, I'm very pleased with, I'm very proud of the work that the district is doing, that Celia Snow, the director of special education is doing, and that our teachers are doing in terms of meeting the needs of every student in the least restrictive environment. We do a very, very excellent job of including students in the general education environment and providing them with support to be able to access the curriculum in that environment. I think that our screening three times a year where we identify early on if students need assistance and then intervene. I think all of these things work together to support students in being more academically successful in the classroom. And again, we have really top-notch teachers, the general ed education environment and the special education environment. We have at Hopkins Academy, a teacher who just starting this year did a lot of work in co-teaching um, and has done an excellent job, Ms. Mulligetta, in supporting students there. So all those things come together and make it more likely that a student will be successful in our school district. And I also want to say, and the other part of your question or your assumption, is it just do populations change? And yes. So we can have students move in who already are in out of district placements in their individual education plans. And then if they move into the district, we just continue that. Um, so some of it has to do with changing populations. And I, I would like to think, which is why we invest in these programs, that some of it has to do with programming, that those two things complement each other. Thanks, Annie. Any other thoughts or questions for Annie? I had one, but Joyce, go ahead. Hi, Joyce. Hi, uh, just a quick question on the, uh, how you go about with your uh, farming out to your vendors to do your mowing. Do you go out to bid on that with all the people that we have in town that does um, lawn care and things? Or do you just ask for bids and do the lowest bidder? Uh, because the price is over $10,000, we do have to get three prices for that job. Um, okay. So last year we did get three prices on it. And um, I'd have to check the contract. I don't remember with OMAST if it was multiple year or not. Um, if it is, we could certainly have it up to two more years. If it's not, we'll go out again and get three quotes. Um, it's not at the threshold to go out to an actual bid, um, which is $100,000, but um, we, we did get the quotes, yes. Okay, so in adding the elementary school, would that change the scope of the work that you would need to go out to get three different quotes because you're adding the elementary school? No, it, it was still below the threshold. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, Tara, go ahead. Sorry, I just had one question. Um, I, I guess, Annie, when you reviewed this, first of all, thank you for the document, you and Chris. It, 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 again, just to reiterate, it's really clear and easy to read and understand um, what's going on. And I'm excited to see um, the um, following and expansion of the STEAM program, because that's just a fantastic program. And I'm excited to see that it's relevant um, and I, the kids love it. So I'm excited. Um, the question that I had is on the, um, additional support staff, um, three FTEs of ESPs. Is that something that we're already hiring for or we're looking to hire for? Have we posted the, them? Do we need to wait? So one, we have one posting that uh, 
is up and we're going to repost it. But also keep in mind when we're looking at the budget comparisons, you're looking at the moment in time. So you're looking at the budget that you approved as a school committee at public hearing in March of 22. And so the comparison point is March of 22 until now. Some of those positions we've actually already hired and we absorb the cost of that. This is one of the reasons we talk about having reserves in school choice. So we don't ever find ourselves having to go back to the town and say, we need to go to town meeting because we need this extra money right now. We have these move-ins, we need these additional support staff. So we're posting for one, two of those positions we've hired since you approved the budget in March of 22 for fiscal year 23. But in terms of the comparison point, that's the comparison point, right? That's what's changing in these lines when we present it to the town. What's what's changed from the budget you approved to the budget we're proposing. Thank does you. that make sense? No, it does. I'm just making sure that that was indeed mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah. the case. And then the same with the... Um, behavioral health? Behavioral health staff, yeah, yeah sorry. I was trying so to... So that's okay. With the behavioral health, what's happening is right now we have, so last year we had 2.5. We had a full-time adjustment counselor at Hopkins Academy. We had a full-time school psychologist who was based out of Hadley Elementary School. We had a 0.5 school psychologist at Hopkins Academy. This year, due to people moving and changing uh, jobs, moving, um, having changes in their career, Right now, we have a full-time adjustment counselor at the elementary school, a full-time adjustment counselor at Hopkins Academy, and we have a 0.5, another adjustment counselor. Right now, school psychs, even though we posted, very high demand, very hard to find. We're using a third-party contractor, James Levine and Associates to do our evaluations, all the other things we would have. So this 1.0 FT, we have found that particularly post pandemic, the behavioral and mental health needs of our students is really high. Having 2.5 adjustment counselors really is not too much. And it would be much better for our district as I certainly don't have to personally explain this to you, Tara, you understand this quite well, it'd be much better for our district. We would prefer to have a school psychologist on staff in house. So our plan is not to replace one of our existing adjustment counselors with a school psych, but rather to add a school psych who would do evaluations and the work of the school psych for both campuses, if that makes sense. One school psych, full-time, correct. That's fantastic. That's what that is. It's fantastic and I'm very happy to hear that. And I'm sorry if that was a repeat from another meeting, but I'm very happy to hear. No, it wasn't. I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> people can understand what that is. And our staff, just to add on real quick, just because you're talking a lot about this and all this extra support and the needs and our staff just is phenomenal. And I have firsthand knowledge of the work that they're doing right now. And not only that, it can be hard as, um, you know, individuals to work cohesively um, in an environment when you're not all thinking the different ways, when you're all trained in different disciplines. And I can just say firsthand, um, I, it just, everyone in different disciplines are just all working um, respectfully and collaboratively and just in the best interest of the students. And I have just been um, so pleased to see how well the school year is going as far as behavioral needs for children or struggles for children and how well staff are working and how communicative they are with um, with parents and with each other. So kudos to all of our staff for that. Thank you so much for those kind words. They are doing a phenomenal job. I'm very pleased with them all settled yeah. and grateful. So thank you. Christine. I was just curious about um, the drop in health services. Why it basically is cut in half. I'm sorry, would you ask me that one more time? I apologize, something happened. On, uh, would you ask me that question again, please? 
uh, just the drop in health services. It, it's uh, Oh, okay. Thank you right very now. much for asking that question. Yes. Because last year that line was increased significantly and we funded it through the elementary uh, secondary emergency relief funding, ESSER funding. Um, but uh, so, so what happened was we infused $112,000 of that money to support pool testing, nurse substitutes. There was a great deal of services that were associated with COVID that were funded through grant funds. And that's why you see the drop because the pool testing program is, it, we haven't continued with that. Right. Okay. Any final questions for Annie or Chris on the budget? Okay, great. Thank you to both of you. And we look forward to um, being apprised of the progress as it makes its way through the town. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to um, item 4B. Um, this is the MASC MASS conference update that I requested to be put on the agenda. There are a couple of related um, report outs under that item that'll come later. But for now, I wanted to give my school committee colleagues a sense of the kinds of things that I took away from this conference which was held uh, in uh, November. And uh, it's fascinating. Uh, this is a, a, uh, an annual meeting of all the school committee members uh, throughout the state. Um, and uh, to your point about behavioral supports and um, our students' needs, um, you know, I'm just gonna take us through sort of like a, a, a whole array of, of learnings. Um, DEI and mental health featured really high on topics. Uh, as you can imagine, post COVID, a lot of schools are really um, uh, focused in these areas out of the need that they're experiencing. Uh, one quote, the kids are not all right. And the adults aren't either, uh, was made by uh, Dr. Lopez Riley and, and Dr. Covina, um, both from William James College. And they, urge that it's a time to double down on uh, learning losses, but not to approach it just in terms of learning losses, but we need to tend to the loss in psychosocial development. People relationally knowing how to be with one another, a culture of, of learning with psychological safety and really building of community using trauma-informed practices, which I know, Annie, you and the team are, um, uh, trained up in and are, uh, so I thought that was really, um, really important. The DEI theme ran strong throughout. Um, at, I learned about Framingham that have a dedicated uh, assistant superintendent for equity, diversity, and community engagement. And th they're a much bigger department than we are, but across department, you could see how Framingham was really embedding um, uh, this practice um, as in the way it uh, disseminated uh, curriculum dollars, field trips, how PTOs uh, operated and you know their multi building model I don't envy at all. We have two schools so we can be really focused but um, I thought it was really um, a kind of a, a bright spot. I've also learned that the collaborative on the eastern part of the state Whereas we have CES, they have something called SEEM, S-E-E-M, and their members, Reading, Melrose, Linfield, Woburn, Wilmington, Stoneham, and North Reading, hired a shared DEI coordinator through their collaborative, um, each kicking in about twenty dollars to $25,000 a year. And uh, this coordinator really held uh, leadership to, uh, to account and it was a coach for the leadership at each of those institutions. And I thought that was an interesting model because you had um, this shared approach. You know, one school wasn't doing it together, multiple schools were doing it and you could kind of compare what was happening across the board. I think there's some role for that to be able to talk about some a shared effort across multiple schools. I mentioned that to the uh, chair of the um, CES who was also at the 
uh, conference and he followed up with Todd Gadza right away. So it's possible, Tara, you'll probably be seeing the fruit of that um, and Annie possibly on the superintendent side. Um, and I know we've just carved out some funding to, to do something uh, specific, but there may be um, a shared services model that is worth looking at to augment in some capacity. Um, I was really keen to learn about how CES is working with Northampton Public Schools to create what they term as affinity groups um, and really creating space for different um, demographics to, um, to, to have a safe space to talk with one another and share. Um, and you can, you know, you really should probably go to CES and find out more about that, but uh, they have, they created a Padlet on, um, bit.ly forward slash MASC mass affinity groups. If you're interested, contact me, but there's a whole host of resources there um, that were fascinating to see. I sat in on an early college session, Annie, you were there, and I found this to be enlightening. It was mostly geared towards um, school districts that have not yet taken on early college programs and urge, you know, a panel of people, uh, districts that have, and the real benefits that they've um, experienced as a result. And I, first of all, I found, I found myself being very lucky to be in that you know, early pilot of having an early college program. And I found it to be really interesting what they were sharing. Um, but in particular, I found it to be a really good sort of like challenge to AP. Early college in some respects is even better than AP. And AP is still considered to be like a gold star. My own daughter just took two APs, hasn't taken any early college classes and much to my chagrin. And so I wonder what, you know, we can do around, uh, around uh, outreach for that. And I know, Annie, you brought up an excellent point, which is that the state really needs to think about transportation funding if this is really targeted towards uh, making equitable access to, uh, to demographics that wouldn't ordinarily go down the college track and have them see themselves as a college able student, then they need to be able to get there. And oftentimes those same students can't afford a car or have transportation. Um, so excellent point. And I think that's something that we should think about, I, I'm hoping that you can bring forth the, here's how we're doing with early college sometime later, along with recommendations that we can um, advocate for at the state level, if in fact that is a priority to, to uh, that we should turn our attention to. I thought that um, there were some great sessions on leading and governing schools during emotionally and politically charged era. I think we're all, we all think about that. I was very grateful for my school committee members and the way in which we collaborate with one another and have norms that, uh, that model for the school community, how we want to uh, treat one another. I thought it was interesting that um, they were really talking about empowering teachers to have these conversations in class. And a lot of people shy away from difficult conversations like that. Um, I thought, I, I wrote down, take down the temperature by not trying to convince right off the bat that your position is right or wrong, but really making space for people to just share what they're thinking and feeling. So I, I wonder uh, how we bring that back, uh, cr creating, uh, creating the conditions to talk to one another, creating a culture of being able to talk to one another. Um, excellent session on leading equity with intentional practice. I won't go through all of it, um, but I will say equity is a verb and we use it as a noun, but it's really a verb that we need to be acting uh, in terms of uh, in, in all things with an equitable lens. Um, I'm going to fast forward to uh, polarizing debates, communities divided, how to navigate polarizing debates. I think that was the one where I especially thank my lucky stars to have excellent colleagues in all of you. Um, and uh, we have um, we have a, we had a session called Heating Up, which I attended because Paul introduced me to. Sarah Ross, the founder, co-founder of a nonprofit, and and we were able, we were lucky enough to get Sarah Ross on the line to tell us a little bit about um, heating up uh, the session and uh, what some of the nonprofit strategies are. Uh, but basically, this is 
you know, schools represent a large consumer of energy. We talked about oil and the fluctuating prices of oil. Um, how might we uh, leverage incentives that the federal government has made available as, as well as the state to, um, to look at investments that we're going to be making anyways and consider uh, them being green. So I will in a moment uh, call on my, um, on, on uh, Sarah Ross, who's graciously agreed to be here to share and Jack Sikowski, who um, Paul uh, invited. Um, and Jack, I'm so glad you're here as well. Hang on one second and I will turn to you. Um, I Last thing I wanna share is about students. We've had student participation on this body intermittently, and it, it's been just that, it's been intermittent. It turns out that it's required by law to have up to a five member student advisory board who meets with the school committee every other month, possibly every month, but every other month, required by law, and this law goes back to the 1970s. And so um, I've already, put some ideas together and had some early conversations with Annie and I really look forward to coming back to the team addressing this issue because I think that closeness to what the students are thinking and feeling and having them weigh in on the very things that govern their experience is really important. And um, I'm gonna pause there and see if anyone has any thoughts or comments on what I've discussed thus far before I, uh, go further into the conversation about uh, renewable energy. I think specific, thanks for the report. I mean, it's, I imagine the big themes were those of, it's not all right, the students are not all right. And coming, I mean, what does it mean a post or relatively post pandemic world, huh? Yeah, I mean, um, anxiety and depression was always an issue. You know, even pre-pandemic, we just didn't talk about it as much. And now, right. after a year or two of isolation and lack of um, consistent training and support in how to interact with one another <clears throat> in a very unusually, you know, um, toxic, broad, broad, you know, political environment, there, it just makes for a terrible cocktail. And so what whatever we can do to support, I think, the efforts uh, around safe schools. I'm really glad we addressed that last uh, meeting um, around behavioral supports. Um, uh, Annie can speak to the array of, of things that we've put together, but yes, it's incredibly important at this point in time. Um, I just want to say- Sorry, go ahead. I just want to say thank you both for attending and thank you for reporting back this, you know, very thorough um, review. And I'm really happy to see the discussions being had because I'm not sure how we would expect our students and our children to be able to talk about these sorts of things if we as their adults and mentors um, aren't able to talk about them. So I'm glad it's being brought to the table and I'm glad the discussions are being had. And I'm proud of where Hadley stands right now, um, really at the forefront and a little um, ahead of the game here as as far as some of these things that you've reported, it's, it's important. So I'm glad that we're having the conversation to show our children, it's okay to have these conversations and it's okay to talk about this. So thank you for that report. You're welcome. And if I may, Humira, I did speak. I would also like to just speak to Paul's question and point, and just to help the public understand some of the things that our school district is doing to address the fact that students and faculty and staff have had a very challenging past couple of years. So, a reminder we were successful in securing a highly competitive mental health support grant last year and received continuation funding for that grant this year. This year we received funding for year one of another highly competitive grant on safe schools and integrating social and emotional supports to ensure that schools are safe. We also received a smaller grant that's about integrating social and emotional and academic learning this year. We received several other grants, but I'm focusing on those that address the social and emotional and behavioral health needs of students. We will be starting uh, our first faculty and staff 
cohort of training and restorative justice with Suffolk University. This will be at Hopkins Academy. That will begin late winter of this year. As you know, we're many years into responsive classroom and have a dedicated social emotional learning and multi-tiered systems of support coach for the district. Um, and we also are many years into positive behavioral interventions and supports in the district. Uh, you approved, thank you, a safe schools and diversity, equity and inclusion specialist role for the district. And I received notification today of another grant award that will allow us to, there are many things that funds, but it also will fund for two people in the district to be trained as facilitators in intergroup dialogue. I appreciate, to echo what Humera has said, I have always appreciated how the school committee models what it looks like to have debate and civil discourse. In this regard, I believe school committees are educators and we have the opportunity to show students, families, and the broader community that you can have a difference of opinion without acrimony or social divisions. And I believe sincerely that you folks have modeled that beautifully. During the pandemic, we didn't always agree. We weren't always sure what the best strategy was to move forward, and um, but we didn't shy away from having a conversation. And that was always done with civility and with courtesy and um, a respect for differences of perspective and opinion. So I, I do believe strongly that you folks have been excellent educators in that regard. And I believe this district is doing phenomenal work when you think about how small we are uh, in terms of all that grant funding, those projects and programs that are moving forward. I, I believe we really do punch above our weight when it comes to some of this work. Well said. Thank you, Annie. Okay, terrific. If there are no other comments or questions on what was shared, let's proceed with the sub items. A summary of K-12 Undaunted session. We've invited Sarah Ross of the nonprofit K-12 Undaunted. And I'm uh, Sarah, I'm making you co-host and inviting you to unmute. And uh, very good, thank you, welcome. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here with you all. Um, yeah, so I am with a nonprofit that's focused on how to help schools really enhance their infrastructure to become more resilient. And in doing so, also combine that with preparation for students to thrive in a world that is characterized by rapidly changing climate. Uh, and it was in that context that I moderated this panel, specifically looking at school HVAC systems, um, the importance as this body well knows uh, for those systems in supporting student health, the continued pressure on those systems, you know, even thinking beyond COVID, if we can ever get there, uh, extreme heat is on the rise. And so that was really the motivator and the, and the title of the session on kind of heating up. And all this comes at a time when there are new funding opportunities. So I'm going to talk a bit about just like the big ideas from that session and specifically that the funding opportunities that are available today, because I think uh, as a district, you all are remarkably well placed. The timing of, you know, your, your systems and the need to replace them puts you in a really interesting spot here. So, you know, the big idea today is that schools have, have the ability to move from what is essentially legacy technology um, to modern technology that is vastly more efficient, that also provides cooling, which many of our schools really need and were not built to accommodate originally, and that um, this technology promotes much cleaner air, right? So one of the big innovations since you all last installed the heating system many decades ago was that now instead of burning fuels to create heat, we can instead move heat that already exists outside of the air, in the ground. Um, these are called air source heat pumps if we're moving it from the air or ground source heat pumps if we're stealing heat from the ground. Uh, and so many of you may be, some of you may already be using this technology in your, your homes. It's now um, you know, being used in buildings of all types. Uh, and as I said, it's vastly more efficient. So your oil system today uh, might be 60% efficient. If you got a new version of what you have today, it might be 95% efficient. These heat pumps are gonna be 200 to 600% efficient. Cause again, they're using just a small amount of energy to move heat that already exists in the world 
rather than trying to create new heat. And that's just a smarter way to do things. So I think that's one of the benefits. Um, you know, the other one is obviously by not combusting things like oil in buildings, uh, in, that combustion creates particulate matter that is not good for, um, for health, right? It, it produces matter that can trigger asthma and other serious health concerns. I think there's a health benefit to this move from a legacy world to modern technology world. And then again, these heat pumps also provide cooling because moving heat from outside the building to warm it, you can also kind of reverse that and, and cool your building all with one piece of equipment. Um, so, you know, for a bunch of those reasons, I think it's a really wonderful technology that um, schools across the country are increasingly looking to incorporate. And again, they're, they're increasingly looking to incorporate right now uh, because of increased funding opportunities for this. So the Inflation Reduction Act, which became law back in August, this is a federal piece of legislation, provides what you can think of as essentially 30%, uh, if not 40% off coupon for this system. Um, that's good for 10 years. There's no cap on the amount of money that's available. Uh, it is not competitive. If you install the widget, you get the, you know, you kind of use the coupon at the, at the cash register, if you will. Um, so that has radically changed the landscape for this technology. Um, and then in addition, you know, we are in a state where um, we have aspirations to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So your utility Eversource has a new strategic plan that has them laser focused on converting as many of their customers as possible to heat pumps. And so they also have generous incentives. Uh, for a typical school, um, it might be a million dollar incentive, you know, again, off the cost of these systems, which are substantial, you know, big, big capital investments, as you all know. You can stack these investments. And so it's really going to make um, this technology, which again, has so many benefits from a health efficiency, uh, cooling perspective, uh, much, much, much more affordable. And in fact, maybe the most affordable system you guys could look at it doing. So it's a change from what you have now, and yet it's the way that anyone who is building a new building today, it's the type of system they would use. You know, no one would put the type of system you have in your school today in a new building. You just, no one would, no one would do that. So, um, so this replacement opportunity that you have is the most cost-effective time to make this switch, right? When you got an old thing that's the end of its life, now is the chance um, to think about making that, that switch. And you know, as we heard from, from earlier, it was interesting hearing about, you know, the, the budgetary, um, you know, the ways that your budget has to absorb the volatility of oil prices that you guys are exposed to right now. One of the opportunities of moving to a heat pump is you can really, if you pair it with solar, completely fix your energy costs, right? Because if you're making your own solar energy and you're using that solar energy to power your HVAC system, now the price of oil can do whatever it wants and it won't touch your school budget. So there's a real opportunity to reduce volatility and protect your budget for you know, the spending in your core mission um, rather than having it be eroded uh, with those changes. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, um, another perspective here is just the move of state policy and state building codes. A new building code will be coming into effect July of next year. Again, it's going to move all buildings of all types, our homes, our businesses, our schools, our hospitals, to eliminate the burning of fossil fuels in our building. And so you're right, you want to be positioning yourself not to be at odds with where policy and codes are going, um, but really anticipating that. And again, a move to heat pumps would anticipate where, where all signs are, you know, we're, we're going to be pushed in every way possible to move in this direction. So again, you guys have a, a wonderful opportunity with this replacement to look at that horizon and, and make smart decisions for the next 50 years, you know, of supporting student health and learning. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to bring a little bit of the MASC conference to, uh, to uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, at the panel where you, uh, where you spoke, you had three other members and, and there was a, um, there was a member of a school system that had built, I think, a brand new building, and uh, they they had uh, they they had some ambitious 
uh, goals. I think it was it was a zero carbon goal that they uh, said. Yeah. Net zero energy. I don't think they're going to zero carbon, but net zero energy. So they're going to produce on site as much energy as they need to run the building. Um, they're also net zero water. So they're capturing rainwater that hits their roof and using it in their system. It turns out I did not know this. 80% of all the water usage at the school. Does anyone want to guess what, what is using 80% of the water? I'll give you a hint. It's not a, it's not the pretty part of being the toilets. Yeah. Toilet. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't need that water to be potable. So they're grabbing all the water that hits their roof, putting in their toilets. They've massively reduced their water bill um, and stormwater, you know, kind of stormwater management. So they're, they're doing a lot of smart things there. They aspire to be, but I don't think they will ever get to, or they, they don't think they'll ever get to net zero waste. That's like the third net zero, but yeah, that's, that's an example of a, you know, a very ambitious and kind of leading the way district that's new construction. Um, but, you know, they're really important work that we have to do retrofitting our existing buildings and you know, the heat pumps that we talked about are an important retrofit opportunity for all existing school buildings in the Commonwealth. Great. Thank you. Other questions for Sarah Ross. Hey, Sarah, thanks for the presentation. So you also mentioned two solar. Are there commensurate uh, credits or deductions for solar? There are, and it looks like one of your fellow committee members there knows, knows the story too. Yeah, essentially the incentives that I mentioned for the heat pumps, this is, um, it's the same incentive they've had for since 2008 now for solar. And the reason, you know, we see lots of solar around Hadley and in other communities is because the federal government has been incentivizing this. Uh, with what used to be just purely a tax credit. And that's what made some of these incentives harder for schools to access. Um, so yes, there is still a 30% uh, tax credit that is now available as a direct cash payment for non-taxable entities like schools that is still available for solar. And now it is also available for these heat pumps. So essentially you could get both of these technologies. And again, they work so well together, right? Because you as soon as you purchase that solar and install it, you, you know what your cost for all those electrons will be for as long as that system, which is, you know, is operating, which is, you know, in the 20 to 30 years, if not longer time frame. So yeah, you could do solar and get a massive, you know, coupon off of that cost and make, you know, the commensurate capital investment in your new HVAC system. And these two would work beautifully together. Any other questions for Sarah? Ethan, you were nodding your head. Have you, are you, are you at a school that has solar? No, uh, well, yes, we have a huge solar field. We, we installed a couple of years ago and, and it's been incredibly, I was just, I, I had spoken earlier in our conversations in earlier months about the interest in having solar panels at, at Hopkins, just given the, the setup that we have there. And I'm just happy that it got brought up. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Um, back in April of 2022, we had Colliers come give a presentation on their findings as it, re uh, it relates to all the things our school needed for, uh, for up, you know, to, 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 make it, uh, to make it sound. Um, got really good bones, needs new heating, needs a bunch of other things, and they put together a plan. Um, at that meeting, and I went back and actually reviewed the recording. There was a lot of interest on the part of our body to um, look at solar and look at renewable energy. I think there wasn't an action item at that time for Colliers to go back and uh, redo and, and you know make a, uh, modifications to the proposal, nor, nor did we come together and say, hey, this is important to us. And I think that was just, you know, it, I was reminded of that at MASC, hearing Sarah and her colleagues talk about this important opportunity. We have this ESSER funding, we know we're gonna in, invest in the schools, how valuable it would be for us to make some uh, goals around renewables that um, had us spending our money towards efficient and cleaner, uh, smart technologies. And so, one of the things I'd like us to consider tonight is asking, um, uh, there's Eversource, they do um, uh, audits of municipal buildings and tell you what opportunities there are to be more efficient. It's kind of like MassSave does on the 
outside, it's just for municipalities, and ask Colliers to um, to give us a like take another look at that proposal and make some recommendations about where we could go clean or green. Um, so I'd like us to think about that. I, I know we have one other colleague on the line. Um, so I'm gonna at this time ask Jack Sikowski to join the conversation and share about, um, I know Hadley is making some moves in this direction through um, the climate committee. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Hi, Humera, and, and thanks. Um, I'm a appreciative of this opportunity to speak to the school committee. So I'm the chair of the Hadley Climate Change Committee. And uh, Humera, you had mentioned about doing the energy audit. And Annie, you might have some insight into this. Last week, we had Rich Finn from Eversource. They're doing the energy audit of all the municipal buildings. And they were supposed to be calling DREX to set up a time where they could come in and audit the schools. I'm seeing a nodding head. Is that a uh, yes? Yes, and Chris could speak to if he might know whether or not that's been scheduled. But uh, as I know, Chris, you would also notice that there were people walking through the building doing what we believed was an audit previously. So either if it hasn't been completed yet, then we'll be coordinating with them to make sure that Eversource does that audit of the school buildings as well. Yeah. I believe it's scheduled for tomorrow, actually. Excellent. That's timing. All right. Um, so they've also toured quite a few of the other municipal buildings. They haven't been working on the three newest buildings, the North Hadley Fire Station, the a library and the senior center because they're new and they're built to the better building codes. But when it comes to green communities, the last step in that process of applying for the Mass Department of Energy Resources grant for $130,000 is to see if there are ways that we can actually reduce our energy. We have had one other person in the past walk through the buildings. Um, they, had, they had less success. That's one reason we went back to Eversource and they helped us find energy source to come in to see if we can do that. So that's a great next step. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and the timing is perfect. Um, so one question I have as, a, you know, a member of another town committee is how else can we help? And I'm so pleased to hear Sarah talking about the possibility of solar, the possibility of more modern equipment and heat pumps. Um, are there anything else that you folks can think of related to utility costs that we should be looking at or could be looking at? Well, thank you first for the offer. Very, uh, very important and awesome to know that we have uh, a committee behind us whose goals are aligned that we can turn to um, to uh, create a solid proposal and have town support, um, of course, sanctioned by select board. Uh, so when the time comes, it's great to know that there's a body that we can interact with who understands what we're trying to do and can advocate alongside us. I don't think at this time we have specific things that we could say, this is exactly how you can help, um, but we will definitely be uh, holding that in mind. So Humera, just taking that a little further, so even if we um, can't go further on utility costs, but I do think there are ways, um, knowing how involved Franklin County schools are with composting. We would love ultimately to see that um, in both of the schools. There's really no reason to take the food waste and bury it. And I know that from my time spent on the farm. Uh, we would love to see if there are solar initiatives, if we can be part of that. Um, last year, we were able to do a climate day. Um, there were educational opportunities. Um, I know the school that I teach at, we are part of cooler communities. I know they've tried for years and years. Um, it's been challenging to say the least uh, for how these schools to get involved with that, but you know, they're, they're often interested. Um, and in collaboration with kids, uh, when we started this committee a few years ago, we had a student member, uh, Ali Markowski, and she added a lot to our conversations and what we were thinking about and what we were working on. Um, we have a seven member committee, all volunteers. 
we're trying to move this forward, but it would be great. And we've asked a number of times if there's a way we can get some student members. Um, certainly that's an offer. Um, climate change is really the issue of our times. And I think it was interesting that just a couple weeks ago, Prince William and Princess Kate held their Earthshot event in Boston and celebrated five incredible inventions uh, and they were trying to move that forward. So clearly this is something in the news almost on a daily basis. Thank you, Jack. We will surely take you up on that offer. We too are trying to get student engagement on our body and we will encourage that overlap, I think, uh, leveraging their interest and their knowledge of how systems uh, actually work on their behalf. They could really help, uh, help, help us uh, navigate um, alongside our amazing faculty and staff. Um, so definitely noted that we will uh, that we have a lot of a lot of opportunities, um, a lot of things to look at, and we will uh, cycle back to you on that. Thanks so much. All right, I appreciate it. Hey, can I ask a question, Jack, before you go? So yeah. thanks for thanks yeah. for coming. First off, um, the EverSource and maybe Sarah of Americas. I know we met with EverSource too. That the audit they're going to do. So what we need, we need information, right? How much would this cost? What, how much uh, would we get from the federal government, from the state government, um, both for whether it be a ground source system and solar, you know, itemized costs so we can assess this. We know what the proposed revision to an HVAC system with the traditional technology or updated traditional technology. It's like $3 million, I think, if I remember it co collected correctly. So how, is that, are we going to get that level of detail from Eversource or do we need to go to another consultant to help get that? Sarah is probably the expert on this. Okay. Well, the first thing I'll say is um, there are audits for many different things, right? All energy audits are not created equal. Right. And you may be getting kind of the base energy audit from Eversource, That's looking, hey, where can we switch out some light bulbs? Where right. can we put in some more insulation? That is different from an audit that says, how can this building transition from being a legacy building that is burning fossil fuels to a building of the future that is running on heat pumps? That's a different type of audit. Yeah. So my guess, and I don't know, cause I didn't put this particular audit in motion is that that was kind of the vanilla base flavored audit that's being done right now. And if we want to pursue, you know, if the district wants to pursue moving to this modern HVAC technology, we need to ask a different question of the audit. And Eversource can provide this audit too, right? It's the ice cream store, they have vanilla and they have chocolate. We need to ask for chocolate and say, you know, we want to explore moving to this modern technology. And that is going to mean looking at the whole building system and doing a different type of audit. So that's my guess is you're going to get some, some information from this audit that's maybe happening tomorrow and that we should also go back to our friends at Eversource mm -hmm. and again they're they're a big company with lots of silos as as happens and so we need to go back to the people that you know are focused on deploying heat pumps and say we want the chocolate flavored audit to see if we can you know what's what is the pathway to doing that with you all yeah so Sarah let me just clarify here this is vanilla with a little bit of marshmallow topping <laughs> Uh, this is energy source. This is not Eversource, but this is a company that Eversource approves. You know, they're on their contractor list. So they are going in and they are looking at all sorts of uh, ways that we can save some energy for our green communities application. Yep. You know, it's a shame. There's We are the second to the last town in Hampshire County um, to be part of the green communities group. It just breaks my heart that this didn't happen a decade ago or two decades ago, but it didn't. And it's really important. And this is the key point where we're doing an energy reduction plan on municipal buildings. Um, I don't even know if we have a great handle, although there might be some accountants here who can push back on that, on our actual utility use in town. It's just very cumbersome to get some of those numbers um, but we are trying to dig a little bit deeper and not just do the base vanilla, but a little bit more. Terrific. Thank you to you both. I think it's really important that we, um, we realize we're an elected body of the schools. We have a building that we're responsible for. There's a business case here. There's money we're going to expend. There's money in uh, federal incentives. We need to be good stewards of, uh, of how to expend those dollars in a way that 
uh, uh, it, it makes lasting impact for our, our students and, and towards our future. So thank you. We will be in touch with you both. You're excellent advisors to this effort. Annie, I, please call on Sarah Ross and Jack Sikowski to support in this effort. And I'd like to um, entertain a motion to um, ask Eversource and municipal uh, folks, the people who understand this, to come in and uh, conduct an audit they've offered. We should accept that and ask them to come in um, and to ask Colliers to, uh, to just relook at the plan and build in some, um, some of this uh, opportunity and, and tell us what, what is that, how does that change anything so we can make an informed decision about how to modify uh, our plans. Do I hear uh, a motion to invite Eversource in for an audit and invite Colliers to uh, think about renewable technology? It just, this is Paul, thanks Sarah and Jack. So to be clear, are you saying they do that simultaneously or would one be a precursor to the next? Um, is Eversource's analysis, and it says our energy source and then Eversource will have multiple analyses, some of which might help inform what Colliers comes back to us. But my sense is, is Colliers, Colliers is not going to give us a renewable energy estimate for no, one, one would one would be a precursor to the next, but I wouldn't want to do one if we were not going down the path of uh, evaluating what the implications were financially for us. So I, I see them as both necessary and I'd like us to move down the path of exploring that. I'm fine if both needs to be engaged. I, I, I must admit, I don't fully understand what, who can provide what. I, I know Eversource offered, and I think they're a free service. And if they can give us a, a cost estimate for what something like a ground source heat pump would cost, a solar system would cost, that's great. If they can't do it alone and we need a Collier's, great. Whatever it takes. I, I, I totally agree with your intent, Numera. Great. Yeah. So that's a motion? Yes, motion. Is there a second? I second that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any discussion, thoughts? as soon as we can. And that we start with services as soon as we can, because I've seen many kids who we start, you know, they started in seventh grade and by high school, they're, they're not nearly as, uh, they don't have the, de the same deficits. They, they've, we've worked with them. We've done everything we can for them and they've blossomed. And I'm a, a I can't say enough about our programs. Um, I think it's one of the, I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, we, we do as well as we do. So I'm really, I'm really, really appreciative of our special eds. Thank you, Christine. Um, so I'm supportive of this hundred percent. And, um, I think that we should always make sure our staff is working to their highest capacity and abilities. Um, and I um, feel as though Celia, um, you know, we should utilize her to her highest potential. Um, and we should also ensure that um, we are not 
um, setting somebody up to get burnt out, right? So the special education director role slash team leader, and we've changed this title over the years a few times um, to kind of suit whatever needs um, we needed in, in the district. And I thank Annie for constantly reviewing this and looking at this, um, but it's had a lot of turnover lately. Um, and we've got somebody who's working out fantastically in the district, um, and I'd hate to see burnout as well. She's got a lot on her plate. Um, so I, I like her being able to work to her fullest potential and utilizing people where they're best served to be utilized. And I appreciate um, very much so in every instance, not, you know, this is one example, but in, in many instances where Annie likes to promote within if she sees the potential for somebody um, who may have an interest to be able to gain experiences in areas that they're interested in. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity all around. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any questions or comments, but I would I would support a motion for this. And thank you, Annie, for consistently reviewing this. I'll take that as a first. Uh, and I just ask one real quick question, yeah. Annie, just so that I better understand this. You, you're planning on taking a, a current teacher and putting them into this role. Um, will we be backfilling or this is just more of a reallocation, right? We're not going to go out and hire another teacher or is there a plan for that? Well, what we're going to make sure when we evaluate this is that without feeling stressed, we can meet the needs of all our, our, our individual education plans. What we believe right now is we can, we can post to this in-house. We can see if there are people interested in moving on to uh, this kind of position and that we have the staff right now. So we would just simply reallocate. We had to hire additional for whatever reason, somebody moved in or just we mm -hmm. realized needs change. We also have sufficient funding in school choice. So you don't have to worry in terms of budgeting. I would keep you folks aware if we had to add and the reasons why, what was driving that, but we do have funding available. Right now, I believe we can do this through reallocation. Great. So Tara made a motion. Do I hear a second? Second it. Happy to second, yes. All right. I think we have like everyone ready to say yeah. yes. <laughs> um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Annie. Moving on to item 4E, we have a second reading of the proposed SRO MOU. Um, we need to take uh, action on this tonight. We'll be voting. Um, on approval, does anyone have any uh, questions or comments about this uh, policy? I don't have any questions, just a comment. This was a tall order. This was started under um, Humera and I, and we had just, just barely started that conversation um, when we made the transition. So it was a really, a really big task at hand. So thank you guys for taking that on. Um, it's extremely thorough um, and thoughtful. So thank you. Terrific. I know there was a community member who uh, sent a resource, Annie, about um, schools that were um, making trade-off choices between their SRO programs and restorative justice approaches and hiring up a team of restorative justice uh, folks to address uh, disciplinary issues. Uh, can you... Um, you, you shared some interesting information. I, I, I wonder if you could comment on that so we could just illuminate uh, sure. opportunity. Happy to. So in our community, we do not see these things as either or. We don't see it, excellent word, as a trade-off. Our school resource officer is a position that is shared among four buildings and three entities. So two buildings in Hadley Public Schools, Chinese Immersion Charter School, and Hartsbrook. And we share a town resource officer. One of the things that this article that was shared uh, that was sent to us earlier today from a community member. It talked about the fact that in some schools, school resource officers are used to enforce discipline and kind of an extension of a dean of students or an assistant principal. We have never used a school resource officer in that capacity in Hadley. Our school resource officers are there to build relationships with students, to be engaged with the community, to build relationships 
with the community and to help ensure overall safety. So they're constantly, even with our cameras, we invited them into that conversation. They're, they're there meeting with students, talking with students, sometimes teaching classes, giving public information sessions. They're also constantly walking the grounds and looking for uh, anything that catches their attention. They say, maybe we need to drill something or we need to be aware of something. So their role really is about community engagement. And on behalf of the police department, there is increasing emphasis on the importance of police being engaged with communities, community policing. We're a part of the community. They're in the community meeting children and families. They do not enforce discipline. We do not call them in to assist us with discipline. Our disciplinary approaches are positive behavioral interventions. That includes responsive classroom, positive behavioral interventions and supports. We'll be starting training in restorative justice in the spring with Suffolk University and their Center for Restorative Justice. So all of these things are complementary. Again, we never see it as an either or. We see all of these things working together to create a safe and supportive learning environment for students. Thank you, Annie. Um, I wanna, I, I think that's excellent and, um, and it helps us understand how, um, how we tr use uh, our, you know, the, the, how we especially, you know, uh, differentiate. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't necessarily utilize restorative justice approaches in the future. And in fact, you are exploring how those relate to our district as well, are, are you not? Excuse me, yes. So the first cohort of faculty and staff at Hopkins Academy will receive training from the Center for Restorative Justice in late winter. The second cohort, will receive training in the spring. That first cohort will then get intensive training over the summer. So we have a timetable to bring us up to full implementation and the position that you had approved for safe schools, diversity, equity, and inclusion specialists will be a key person in helping us advance this work. Restorative justice practices are practices that help us to repair relationships. It is an approach that says there, we, we will collide with each other as human beings. We will hurt each other's feelings. This is a part of being human and that all of us need tools to repair a relationship when it has been damaged or broken um, because of some sort of transgression. And we wanna make sure our students have those skills. So that's part of a wider, that it's yes, we're moving forward with restorative justice as an evidence-based practice, to help build community. What do you do when there's been a hurt between members of the community? It goes hand in hand with several other um, interventions that we use to help people to build community. We also, as I said, just I learned today, received grant funding that will allow us to train two people. So we'll have in-district intergroup dialogue trained facilitators. So it won't Intergroup dialogue is a way of teaching children and adults how to dialogue across difference, something you touched on earlier, something it feels like that we have a natural inclination toward as a school committee and community. And now we're looking to have people who've been trained in how to really facilitate challenging conversations. So yes, we're doing all of this and we're doing it, I believe, in a very coordinated way. And I'll say again, when I say these things out loud, it's not me doing this, it's the district, it's everybody who works here, and it's the support of the school committee, and I'm not being falsely self-deprecating, it really is the work of our phenomenal faculty and staff. I'll say again, we really do punch above our weight. There are much larger systems who are nowhere near where we are in some of this work. I'd also like to uh, add Hadley um, uh, Police to that. I think they've been, uh, especially with the leadership of Mike Romano, um, and um, Chief Mason. Um, many of you may know that Mike Romano is, um, is uh, not well, he's battling leukemia. Uh, we're trying to spread the word uh, to um, about a GoFundMe. I'm just gonna mention it, Fight With Mike, A Battle Against Leukemia. If you search on GoFundMe, you'll find it. Uh, you can make a donation to his family to, um, to help him fight, uh, fight that. But we really have appreciated his many years of service as an SRO and uh, he is loved by many in the community and we hope that he um, he uh, battles well um, and, and comes back to us safely. Um, Christine, you have your hand up. Um, 
yeah, I, I just wanted to really clarify if if people were to read the SRO description as what their the job is, there is nothing in there that actually has to do with discipline. Um, there is no mention of the officer having any uh, powers within the system to discipline. So I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what, you know, they were talking about in that article. Um, but this is also um, another level of protection for our kids in the fact that one of the functions of an officer or an SRO is to even, um, you know, handle complaints about administrators and teachers that they may not feel comfortable going to administrators or teachers for fear of obvious, you know, their, their kids as well, but obvious retaliation or, so there's a whole other, you know, um, level to this that is supposed to make students feel like they have another outlet in which they can turn to be heard. Um, and so there's a lot of training that has gone into this new SRO program. And it really is so much more than, you know, they're not a security guard they're not a you know a they're not there to yell at kids in the hall they're there to really work with students and help help them feel protected so i'm i'm i just want people to understand that and in all honesty our sro is very excited i uh, i hope i'm not speaking you know on her behalf but i i have seen her um uh earlier today and, and she's very excited about the position and the training she's had. And I think that it's going to be a huge success. I really do. And she's a Hopkins grad. Am I correct yes. in that? Yes, she's yes. a Hopkins grad. Oh, even better. Yep, yep. Excellent. All right, thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the SRO Memorandum of Understanding? So move. And do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Approval of flag request, HES music room and HES art room. Annie. In accordance with the school committee flag policy, I've offered on behalf of the teachers to uh, bring their request to you to delineate the connection to the curriculum of the flag that they're proposing and to culturally responsive practice and connection to district policies. The Hadley Elementary School art and music teachers have requested hanging a progress flag, which you've already approved. It does connect with our district mission statement, and it also connects with recommendations from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'd ask that the school committee approve that um, the pride progress flag be hang in the music room at Hathi Elementary and in the art room. Great, thank you, Annie. Christine. Uh, I'm just curious because the spreadsheet has lists a lot more like more than just those two flags so is this just yes my spreadsheet skills are you will see are a little <laughs> wanting um just scroll down all from column from row 13 and up these were all approved at 12 20 21 they were approved a year ago the two at the bottom are new i'll probably figure out a better way to i'm just keeping running tab of what you all have approved. So I'm looking for approval of 15, row 15 and 16. Yes. Row, row 14 indicates all flags above have yeah. been moved as of 12, yeah. 20, 20, 2021. Oh, okay. Um, so I was not part of this. So if I could just, why is the school committee uh, being asked to approve uh, what, what would be? To make a long story short, mm -hmm. our, our team uh, had uh, requests that were coming in, some that uh, that were aligned with our mission and our our our, uh, our mission of uh, uh, educating students and others that m might not have been. And we decided rather than just uh, say no flags are allowed, 
that we would take on um, the uh, the small housekeeping duty of just approving uh, them on a case by case basis. And so here we are. It's not been a burden. I'm very happy to entertain these. Yeah, no, no, that that's fine. I I just didn't quite understand um, where how this all gets started with the school committee you know, um, approving of, uh, you know, any national flag that happened to be in the room. That's all. I, I guess I was just a little confused as to what, you know, how this all came about with us approving it. That's all. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, that's fine. Fair question. It's kind of an odd task we do, but yeah. I, I, I make a motion to approve those two suggested flags. Thank you, Paul. Seconded. Second. Thank you, Ethan. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. Thank you. Fair, fair question, Christine. Okay. We are almost at the end. Um, business manager reports will be updated in January. Thank you, Chris and Andy, for bringing that back to us. School committee reports and discussion. There still hasn't been a finance or tri board meeting that, uh, that uh, I've been a part of. Uh, waiting for invites on that. CES, Tara, thank you for sharing all the wonderful email that you've been getting. Any updates there? Um, so yeah, thank you. I sent out that email. I apologize, I missed the timing um, for the meeting. And then I gave you just a brief review um, at the end of November for the meeting that we had um, mid-November, uh, kind of about what had happened. Um, and shared the um, director's reports as well. Um, we do not have a meeting this month. We'll have another one in January. Um, and I'll make sure that going forward, anything that just seems um, pretty interesting and pertinent, rather than waiting for our meeting, I might just send it along the way um, as I receive the information outside of meetings. So that way, if there's any questions, um, you guys can review it ahead of time and, and ask those questions either at the meeting or before the meeting. Thank you, That's, that would be very helpful. Great, moving on to policy, Ethan. Uh, nothing to report this month, there was no policy meeting. Okay, terrific, thank you. And on the fields, Paul. I was actually, yeah, thanks. Chris, do you have anything to report on that? I can, um, I mean, there's not a lot of new information, but I did speak with Carlos uh, maybe two or three weeks ago and he had some finalizations to do with the Conservation Commission, and he was expecting that we would be able to go out to bid uh, in probably late January um, and award the bid uh, in late February. So we're, we're almost there, um, and that'll be great to, to get this wrapped up, certainly. So Carlos is our architect at Berkshire Design. That's great, Chris. Thank That's you. correct, yes. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, and capital, Christine. Uh, nothing till spring. All right, terrific. Moving on to announcements. Um, we have Joyce Chunglo here. Joyce, welcome. I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Route 9 Hawk pedestrian signal uh, email. Yes, um, you did receive um, eight, pardon me tonight, but I've got where I got it. I wear a mask all the time, so I'm not sure where I got this cold this evening. So. Uh, bear with me. Um, just to give you a little FYI on the Route 9 also, starting next week and the following week, we will not have any construction. So yay, we can have Route 9 to ourselves in the next two weeks. Um, on the Hawk um, uh, light, uh, there will be a meeting on January 18th, and that will be with DOT and probably only a couple members of the select board. Um, it's not going to be a full-blown meeting with the select board. We just want to get information. We want to go over what that is. You saw in your email uh, today that was sent to us from Elena, who is uh, Senator Comerford's uh, administrative assistant, that, that there's been a change that Route 9 um, and other districts where they've only done a... Uh, middle school and elementary school to designate as school zoned. So that's why the high school was never a school zoned area. But as of 
November, there was a policy and a law that went through about uh, high schools being included in that now. So it looks like it'll be up to the select board, which uh, will be in our further discussion. I don't think it's on our agenda for tomorrow night, but hopefully before our next meeting in January, before they meet with um, the DOT, uh, that we would want to at least pursue that and ask for that to be designated as a zone uh, area also. Um, I'm going to recommend that after our meeting or uh, what we have on January 18th, that there be a public forum so that people, students, anybody can come to this and ask us and ask DOT uh, any questions that they have on their mind about this Hawk area and uh, how we can make a better ruling or change it or do what we need to do to make that a safe area. Uh, I think you all know how I feel about it. I don't, I was against it right from the very beginning. Uh, several years ago when we had um, Route 9 was redone and they were putting bus stops in, the, in that zone there, um, I was not in favor of that. I felt that everybody should be crossing at a designated crosswalk with lights that were appropriate for change for people to cross at a, such a busy street and intersection that we have. So um, these things will take place on January 18th and then we will go forward and hopefully have a public forum um, on what to do. And we can stay tuned for another update on this also. Thank you, Joyce. That is indeed very important to our group and we will make sure to publicize any dates that you have about, yeah. um, uh, about the public to weigh in. I did find your meeting very informative this evening and uh, thank you all for your hard work. I do appreciate um, all the collaborative that you actually do uh, between all of our committees and everybody in town. Uh, you really gather everybody in and it's, it's nice that we all can work together. Um, you did mention also about the uh, finances and Annie, you did a perfect job uh, explaining on how the process goes, that all of your budgets are in right now. Uh, it will go before our treasurer, who is Linda Sanderson, and our administrator, Carolyn Brennan. And then the finance committee is very in tuned on getting all of these things together and meeting with all of the um, entities on, on their budgets. And then it goes forward again to the town treasurer and she sees where our money is and see what, how it goes. And I think Linda did a fabulous job um, at our uh, special town meeting in October and giving us our budget and having those numbers and everything that I think everybody could understand. So uh, she will do that again, because that's her. Um, so we will you know, still all work together to make sure that all of our budgets work. Um, appreciate the school committee and, and, the, and Annie and how you do, and Chris, and how you do your budget. Um, and what you've given back to the town has been astronomical for us too. So we do appreciate that all around. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Really appreciate it. Okay, um, moving on to item B, school committee member updates. So anyone on the team have announcements to make? Okay, I'm gonna take the moment uh, to uh, acknowledge uh, the passing of uh, Duff Pipchinski. Um, Duff you. has been a, a longtime uh, member of the community, uh, bus driver, uh, just police chief, um, has uh, children and grandchildren and great grandchildren in, in the community. And he passed away this last week. Yes, uh, we and lot, lots of extended family. Thank you for mentioning your family. We extend yeah. our condolences to the family. Um, uh, the family is in our hearts. He lived, he lived a pretty incredible life. And at 90, he, you know, you can't expect much more. So thank you for that. Indeed, indeed. Onward to upcoming events, Hadley Public Schools calendar. 
Just a reminder to our parents and students, although I doubt the students need reminding, this Friday is a half day district wide and there's no school next week. Please don't bring your children to school. I'm sure they'll remind you that they don't plan on going. Children return to school on Tuesday, January, oh dear, do I have it open? On the Tuesday, January 3rd is when we resume. Friday's a half day, then you're off, resume January 3rd. Very good, a much deserved break. All right, we have a few action items remaining. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of November 28th? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, passes unanimously. Um, there's the approval of the warrants November 2022. And Annie, I have a question. Is this, um, uh, does this package of warrants include reimbursements to me for the drive to no. No, Thank okay. you for pointing that out. So, uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe so at this point. It wouldn't have turned around that quickly. Um, Otherwise, I, no, I don't believe so either. I think it yeah. I think So it we'll make sure we pull it uh, next time so you can't Thank vote you. on it. I appreciate yeah. it. Do I hear a motion to approve the warrants of November 2022? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we have already approved the team leader job description, the SRO memorandum of understanding and the flag request. Next meeting dates would be January 23rd, policy meeting at 4.30 and school regular school committee meeting at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Does that work for everyone? Terrific. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, and we have no executive session um, this month. And do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Seconded. All right. You don't need to take take an all in favor on that. So thank you, everyone. I just want to thank you. Happy holidays. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays yeah. Pleasure to work with. Um, and so really much deserved rest. Love to your family. Um, and we'll see you again. Uh, you too. Merry, merry, everybody. Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, y'all. Take care. Be safe and healthy. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care.